The views and opinions expressed on this program are those of the participants and do not reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. BronxNet. Your voice, your views, your vision. Hello and welcome to the one and only show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I'm your guest host, Sylvia Anglin, filling in for Darren Jaime. And of course, you're watching the one and only interactive talk show, bringing the best of the Bronx and the world right to you. First up in our legal corner, a discussion on the freedom of speech versus the laws of the FCC. Plus, get ready to savor the best in Bronx cuisine as the borough prepares for the first annual restaurant celebration. And we'll tell you about an organization that is helping restore the gift of sight one country at a time. Also, what does it mean to be a Garifuna? This question one organization is asking high school students to answer in their first ever essay writing contest. Find out more later on in the show. And finally, learn about an event that covers 300 years of Bronx River African American history through the art of books. So stay tuned. All this, much more, is headed your way because you're now officially open. Hello Bronxites, I'm your host Sylvia Anglin and today is October 26th. You're watching Open, the only live interactive program that brings the Bronx and New York straight to your TV set. Feel free to give us a call at 718-960-7241 or send an email to open at bronxnet.org. We also want to let you know that you can hit us up on Facebook by searching under Open Bronxnet Television and Twitter by following our page at Bronxnet TV. It has always and will continue to be a hot topic in the world of broadcasting. The rights of broadcasters versus what the FCC deems suitable for air. Do broadcasters go too far or is the FCC just way too strict? Is freedom of speech being taken away? This is the latest hot topic in the discussion and the continuation of our constitutional law series. Today's Legal Corner is joining us now. Sorry, I apologize for that. Um, in today's Legal Corner, attorney and legal correspondent David Lesh is joining us. Welcome to the set, David. Nice to be back. Not a problem. I, I kind of like, I, I got nervous. I Have heard you missed FCC. me? You haven't seen me in a couple of weeks, so I'm back now. <laughs> All right, so here's the thing. When we're talking about constitutional law, there, there, as opposed to some of the other segments that I've done when I'm, when I'm here, there's never really any clear answer as opposed to you know, landlord-tenant uh, situations or, or other areas of law that I've discussed. You know, there are statutes. Um, this is the law. This is how you should react to it. Um, this is how you should get your papers in and the time limits. When, you, when we're talking about constitutional law now, I'm glad we're back on the constitutional law series. Um, I, sometimes viewers, they say to me, well, you know what, I really, uh, I, I really enjoyed the discussion, but what's the answer? And sometimes I say, well, with respect to the topic, there really isn't an answer. But the point of constitutional law um, is that it, it's the area of the law that is the, that is the least black and white. It's all gray. Uh, and the interesting part about it, the why, why I like discussing areas of constitutional law, is because it gives me a, a chance to kind of look at both sides and, and just really um, stretch my brain into trying to try and get my arms around it to try to figure out what's going on here. And today, I picked this particular topic because I am, in some respects, a broadcaster now, and there are things that I and you cannot say on television. Um, and what we're really talking about is we're talking about indecency laws, right? What's considered to be decent or indecent. But before we do, we have to take a step back to also talk about obscenity laws. Obscenity laws are different than indecency laws, but both will impact the First Amendment freedom of speech, such the constitutional law um, uh, issue, freedom of speech. I'm going to give you an example of um, a type of statute that has limited your ability to um, distribute or, or, or give things out to the public that, um, that the government might seem to be 
obscene. Okay. Um, one particular mm -hmm. statute prohibits using, for instance, um, like the internet to traffic material that would be um, obscene, lewd, uh, lascivious, indecent, filthy, or vile. So that's the government's way to basically prohibit certain people from selling certain things um, that they feel um, would, be con would be considered to be obscene. Okay? This isn't so much indecent, this is obscene. Now why is that important? Because it, imp it impacts on the First Amendment freedom of speech in that freedom of speech um, allows us to be able to say what we, ought, what, what we want when we, ought, we, we want in public. Um, and there are certain types of speech um, that are immediately protected, for instance, political speech. It's the type of speech that the founders, when they created the Constitution, mm -hmm. um, that they immediately said, well, we have to be able to say what we want about certain leaders because we couldn't do that when the king was, you know, was taking over um, uh, the colonies or was ruling the colonies. So basically, w there's a freedom, freedom of speech. Obviously, political speech will be encompassed. But when you're talking about something that might be considered indecent uh, or obscene, um, sexual speech, well, the framers never really considered that to be part of the First Amendment. So when the courts look at this, they have a very difficult time protecting it. Uh, so what, what they have done in the past is they've tried to define what is considered to be um, pornographic speech or speech that you should not be able to say. And the Supreme Court, court judges who have the, some of the brightest men and women in the land have had a hard time defining what is considered to be lewd speech. Um, one particular judge back in 19, I think it was 1964, in a very famous case, and the Supreme Court just, Justice in his concurring opinion basically said, and you may remember this, said, well, I don't know what pornography is, but I know it when I see it. Uh, in other words, I, 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 know, it, I know speech that, I, that is not allowed. I, I can't define it. Well, if, if a Supreme Court justice can't put into words yeah. what would be considered to be obscene, how could you and I know exactly what is or is not um, obscene? So we, have not, we, know, we now have a test. Okay, there's a test okay. that you have to basically meet in able to be able to, to, be able to have certain things um, not considered to be obscene. And that's work that is, if it's taken as a whole, lacks serious literary or artistic value and appeals to the purient interest, um, uh, it, that would be something that would be considered to be obscene. But the, but the problem is, what is defined by, by a purient interest from, by one person is not necessarily the same as what's defined by somebody else. You might have somebody who thinks that anything could be said in public, um, yet you have somebody else who's very prim and proper. Okay. That leads to the indecency laws, which is really what we're discussing today. What you can say while you're on air. Do you understand? Yes. So the question now is uh, on air, mm -hmm. well, w why can't I say whatever I want to say? Certain words, I, I don't understand. It's, there's freedom of speech. It's protected by the Constitution. And I'll tell you why. Okay. Because your ability to be on air is not a right. It's a privilege. It's granted to you by the, by the federal government and monitored by the FCC. Um, similarly, it's driving a car. You, you don't have a right to drive a car. You have a privilege to drive a car. You have a privilege to get a license. It's not a right. It's considered to be a privilege. It's a, semantics, but it's still a difference that's looked at in the law. Okay. When you have a privilege uh, under the law, you have to still meet certain requirements. So something may still be considered to be um, not obscene, okay. but yet indecent. So that is why... You know, uh, I, I don't think you remember George Carlin had a famous uh, comedy skit back into the late 70s, the seven words that you can't say on TV. And he would say these words over and over and over again during his comedy <laughs> skit. It was very, very funny, but you could not say it on air. And then you, now you have some of the, you know, some of the award, um, uh, you know, the MTV awards, yes. and you see people get up there and they, and, and they, and they say words that they shouldn't say, mm -hmm. and it gets bleeped out, and they get in trouble. Because oh, okay. those words are considered to be indecent. The problem is it runs afoul of the, of the First Amendment freedom of speech. And courts have, tr have been trying to hold the FCC back. Um, the FCC said, look, uh, when, when television was first created, we as viewers have a limited amount of content that, that we can watch. Okay. Only a few channels. So when you put on the TV, you're a captive audience. You can't say certain things because you're going to be able to see um, your children, you, you're going to see things that are going to be offensive. But that's not the way it is now. 
There's not just a couple of channels. There are, there are hundreds of channels you can mm -hmm. watch. Other ways to get information, you can pick up books out of the library, different, pl di different pl ways to read things that somebody might consider to be indecent. So why should you not have the right to say certain words or to, or to show certain scenes that others might think is graphic, but you think is protected by freedom of speech. Remember, freedom of speech is not just the spoken word. It's films, it's pictures, it's all covered. Is that why, is that why um, regular broadcasts, um, at first, you know, there were the set, um, the set standard of channels, you know, the ABCs, the NBCs of the world, and then we went to cable, where cable, it seems like the rules are a little different? Because you pay for cable. Okay. You pay extra money for cable. CBS, ABC, C, uh, you know, th those channels are free okay. to the public. Th that's your, th th that's your, your, that's a privilege to watch okay. that. You're not paying for that. That's a privilege. You're watching free network television. Now, of course, there are, there are ad advertisements, so how free is it? When you think about it, you're, you're, you're forced to watch advertisements. Mm -hmm. But when you pay to watch channels, uh -huh. well, that's different. You're paying for a, now you have a right because you're paying for something. So you have a right to see something coming back. But it doesn't mean on those channels they can show anything. Okay. You know, do you understand? There are certain things that you cannot see. Um, and that's a whole area of the law. But in terms of like what we're talking about right now, and you and I do not have the ability to say certain things on air. No. That is because the FCC has said that we have a, a privilege of being here. And we're going to monitor it because children may be watching this show and we don't want children to see certain things. Now you can always say, well, the parent can change the channel. There are, children have other ways of seeing things that they shouldn't see. They go on the internet and the courts have allowed internet uh, um, certain things to, to be, you know, to, to, to be shown because uh -huh. we want to give parents to have, still give parents the, the, the opportunity to see certain things. So I guess wrapping up. Very quickly, there is no real answer, again, when in this constitutional law segment as to whether or not you can or cannot say things, but the most important thing you have to remember is there is a right to freedom of speech and that you have to be careful if others are impeding on your right and it's something you should always be thinking about. Can you log on to the FCC and find out like your rights, what are the current rights, what are the rules, I believe, regulations? I believe it's www.fcc.com, I believe. Okay. Okay. Or, 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 or dot org. Or dot org, I believe okay. it is. But you can see it and they can tell you what you would be limited in your abilities to say while you're on the air. Okay, thank you, David. You're welcome. If you want to savor the best of the Bronx, stay right there because after this, we talk about the first launch of the first ever celebration of Bronx eateries. We're here to celebrate Dream Big Day. We have been really highlighting the theme health. We got to see the incredible artwork and the music and the collages and the dancing. And I want to make sure that the message is clear as to why everybody's here. It's about learning, and learning has to be fun and healthy. To bring Sonia Manzano, Sonia Sotomayor, Supreme Court Justice, and the Surgeon General, Regina Benjamin, all of us coming together to celebrate, to be strong, not to give up, to keep building the community, in this case, to eat healthy. This is what we do in my house. Based on what I saw, the children paid attention to it and really took it in. First thing we're going to do is we're going to learn something called rock star hands. One, two, three, hey! 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 So we're going to do a little bit, let's see. Let's do a little bit of a bomba. We had a wonderful day. We saw all the kids and all of the work that they were doing with the Bronx Children's Museum all summer and they demonstrated it to us. All children are very positive when they're very young and it's our job to keep that enthusiasm going. It's always great to see when they're singing and dancing and being inspired because it can make a major difference in their lives. These kids, this summer program here, learned about healthy foods and exercising. They built this mural. 
as part of their educational experience, as part of their art. Basically done everything that I've been professing that we need to do around the country is get kids active, playing, learning about health and wellness, just giving them a chance to express their desires and let them know that they can dream big. And that's what this is about, dreaming big. I'm so very, very proud of all you kids who are in this program. Because as I said, you're smarter than me. Thank you for doing this this summer. And thank you for being here. Hello there and welcome back to Open. You just had the nice viewing pleasure and the opportunity to see Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor and various other politicians, including the U.S. Surgeon General here in the Bronx, encouraging children at the Bronx Children's Museum to dream big and to do what they have to do to achieve whatever educational goals they have in mind. So today here we have, in conjunction with the New York State Restaurant Association and the Bronx Borough President, Ruben Diaz Jr., who presents Savor the Bronx, the borough's first ever restaurant week beginning Tuesday, November 1st. This event will showcase the Bronx's best eateries who will be offering some pretty tasty lunch and dinner specials. Here to dish out more information is the Executive Director of the Bronx Tourism Council, Doris Quinones. Welcome, Doris. Hi, Sylvia. Good to be with you. So can you tell me what was the, the thought process in bringing Restaurant Week to the Bronx? We always hear about it in Manhattan and various different places. Why the Bronx? Well, uh, the Bronx has just an amazing array of restaurants, and many of them really reflect um, the cultural diversity of the borough as well. And uh, more and more, they're being recognized by magazines and guides to restaurants like Zagat, even Michelin. And so it just seemed like the ideal time to really package the experience, uh, both for New Yorkers and for visitors. And Restaurant Week is just a tried and true formula that's uh, worked well in other communities. And so we felt it was a really great time to bring it to the Bronx. I know the Michelin star, the Michelin award is a very big award as far as chefs are concerned as, in, as far as eateries are concerned. Can you tell me, do we have any Michelin restaurants here in the Bronx? We do have uh, Michelin restaurants and we have lots of Zagat rated restaurants and uh, those change year to year so uh, folks should go to those websites to see uh, which ones are rated. But um, what was really exciting to us is that Bronx restaurants are on the map in a way that hasn't been the case uh, in the past. And so at the Tourism Council, we're especially excited about that because so many times uh, when people go uh, to visit a community, eating is a big part of the visitor experience. And so we want to be sure that they understand um, that there is so much of that um, to, to be had here. Um, and of course, for um, even resident, residents, a lot of times they'll have friends or family come in from out of town. Mm -hmm. And it's important that our own residents be armed with information on where you can take uh, your own visitors to have a great uh, meal here in the Bronx and of course they'll want to visit Manhattan and the region too but it's important that they be armed with that information and the uh, Bronx World President Ruben Diaz Jr. Uh, one of his um, key uh, uh, goals has been to really get greater recognition of all Bronx resources and so um, restaurants are very much up there with our cultural institutions with our performing arts mm -hmm. as information we want to get out to the public. I noticed that um, the restaurant week spans like Central American, African, Asian, South Asian. It touches on various different um, regions. Um, basically for the refined palate or someone who's interested in developing they, their palate, they have an opportunity to visit these various different restaurants. Is this restaurant week similar to with the other restaurant weeks where is there is a discount on dining in, um, what's the discount going to be like? Well, restaurants have a choice of either offering a free dessert and coffee or wine when someone purchases an entree, and that's the offer that some of our restaurants are making. Others are simply taking 20% off the tab, uh, and others are doing a prefix meal uh, where uh, for a certain low price, they'll get a three-course lunch or dinner. And um, as you say, it really is um, the, the spectrum of 
excellent Bronx restaurants. So people will find some of their favorites, for example, on City Island, uh, like Portofino's, like a new French bistro that's opened up on City Island, mm -hmm. as well as on Arthur Avenue, uh, Mario's, which is really legendary, uh, Zero Otonove, which is one of those uh, restaurants that's consistently rated uh, as New York one of, among New York City's top restaurants. And then there'll be a chance to explore new places, like there's a, in Throg's Neck, there's a new restaurant called Flamboyan, that's uh, participating um, also uh, in Throg's Neck, of course, Tosca. If uh, you're more in the mood for a pub, there's the Great Bronx Ale House at Kingsbridge, the Rambling House at Woodlawn. So there's uh, something for everybody and um, just a nice opportunity to either explore a new place you haven't been to or go back to a favorite knowing you're going to get a fantastic deal while you're there. This discussion has made me so hungry. <laughs> um, so when does, this, when does this event start? It starts on November 1st on Tuesday and restaurant week is actually two weeks so it'll go through Sunday November 13th. Perfect. So if people want to find out more information do they visit I Love the Bronx or where should they log on to? They can always um, get information at ilovethebronx.com about everything going on in the Bronx but there's a special website set up for restaurant week okay. and that's Savor the Bronx dot org and uh, we also want to um, give uh, thanks to our other partners, American Express, is sponsoring Bronx Restaurant Week and uh, the Bronx Overall Economic Development Corporation, the Bronx Chamber of Commerce are partners uh, together with, as you said, the New York State Restaurant Association. There will also be food tours going on, of course, our Taste of the Bronx Food Show right here at Lehman in December. So uh, food is, is on the menu in the Bronx and we want folks to take advantage of all of those. So the food tour will be in conjunction with the restaurant week or is that at another time? Actually, we're planning to have some, um, there's some tour operators who are planning food tours during that two week period. And uh, we also encourage people to visit the website, um, savorthebronx.com, to vis visit the website uh, as we get closer to and even during those two weeks, restaurants are coming on board all the time. So they should really check it uh, just when they're making their, their meal plans and find out who are the latest participants. Thank you, Doris. Make sure you visit SavorTheBronx.com and check out what is available for Restaurant Week. There's an organization fighting to restore eyesight worldwide, and the CEO joins us after this. Perfect. There is also a very attractive extended warranty option that includes free service and parts for the next five years. But there's no need for you to get that. You failed to get the test you needed at the doctor that would have detected disease early enough where it could have been treated. So you won't be around in two years to see him grow up, which means the warranty would be useless. Okay, sign here, please. For a list of tests every man should have, go to ahrq.gov. I remember how much you said you liked mine. Oh. <laughs> you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of siblings in foster care who'll take you just as you are. 
Hello viewers, remember this is a live and interactive talk show, so join us in the conversation by calling 718-960-7241 or send us an email at open at bronxnet.org. Orbis International is dedicated to eliminating avoidable blindness and saving sight around the world by providing tools, training, and the technology crucial to quality eye care service. Orbis is also taking their eye care service to the skies with their first ever flying hospital, an aircraft where doctors, nurses, and technicians fly around the world to give the gift of sight. Here to tell us more about Orbis is President and CEO, Dr. Barbara DeBono. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, it's a pleasure. Thank you, can you tell me what is, you're giving the gift of sight. Our sight is very important, it's one of our senses. What does it mean to give this gift to various um, countries and individuals around the world? Well, it's, it's, it's quite an amazing thing to restore the sight to an adult and especially to a child. It opens up a world that never would have been available to that person before. Imagine a child who cannot see. That child cannot go to school, cannot read, cannot learn. If it's a girl in a developing country, her marriage prospects are very, very limited, and her economic future and well-being is very, very much reduced. The wonderful thing about what Orbis is privileged to be able to do is we, we restore that gift of sight through teaching and training and absolutely hands-on public health education and, and surgery. So when we restore sight to a person, their whole world opens up. Their economic future is going to be very different. Their prospects, again, in terms of family and marriage are different. Their ability to really make a difference, the kind of difference they want to make in their society, is, is enhanced tremendously. Orbis is a 30-year-old organization. We're a humanitarian organization that works in developing countries. We work in 89 developing countries. Wow. We're based here in New York. Over the last 30 years, we've trained close to 300,000 healthcare professionals. And these are ophthalmologists, healthcare technicians, people who are nurses, uh, community health workers. We've taught them how to conduct eye exams, how to provide um, eye surgery in the area of anything from cataracts to glaucoma to um, retinopathy of prematurity, just a whole variety of things. Diabetes, which is a growing issue, diabetic retinopathy. We've taught them how to take care of the people in their community who have what we call avoidable blindness. That's blindness that can be treated. That's blindness that can be um, treated in a way that will enhance and restore sight. And there are 39 million people in the world who are blind, and 90% of them live in developing countries. And 80% of that blindness is completely avoidable, meaning that we can treat it, we can do something about it. Okay. We can restore and give that gift of sight. Now you mentioned something earlier about our Flying Eye Hospital. We are the only organization that works in this area that has a Flying Eye Hospital. It's a surgical suite inside a hospital, inside a DC-10 aircraft wow. that is completely outfitted, state of the art, with the absolutely latest equipment. And what we do is we fly about five to 10 volunteer faculty. These are people from all over the world who are experts in their fields. Mm -hmm. We fly them to a particular developing country where we are going to be working and developing programs in, or we already have in-country programs, and they actually do surgery. But what they do is they not only do surgery on patients, and we may do upwards of 10 to 15 patients a day, but we actually teach and train healthcare professionals from those developing countries oh, wow. on the plane with those uh, volunteer faculty. So they're getting hands-on training. They're watching through cameras, through video, right, right there in the OR, in a classroom. They're actually learning how to do state-of-the-art diabetic retinopathy laser surgery. They're learning how to do cataract surgery right there in the hospital. So we were just recently in Peru. We spent three okay. weeks in Peru. Mm -hmm. So we had the hospital go to Peru with, in this case, we had a total of probably about 15 volunteer faculty over this three-week period. Okay. We, we had lots of ophthalmologists, nurses, anesthesiologists, healthcare workers who came onto the plane and learned how to do pediatric surgery, adult surgery, strabismus for children, cataract surgery. And we trained over 80 healthcare professionals on state-of-the-art 
eye care and eye surgery. We then went into the local hospitals in Peru, okay. worked with those same trainees and watched them do surgery in their own hospitals. And again, continued the whole training sequence. And it was a wonderful program. We got fantastic feedback. We worked with five hospitals. And as I said, trained over 80 healthcare professionals. So in, in the decision to create the eye in the sky, so to speak, um, what went into that? Um, was it that you guys are always mobile and you need to travel to different countries so it just makes sense to have this, this aircraft mm. that's able to keep you mobile? Or was it that you, know, you wanted to show different technology to different places and this is a great way to bring new technology and people to different places? Well, you've actually said very well, better than I can. <laughs> Initially, Orbis was created with the concept of taking this hospital and technologies to developing countries. Okay. Now actually what we do is we do both, taking the technology and the training to other countries, but now we also work in consultation with on the ground activities and hospitals and trainees and experts to, to help those individual countries develop the capacity and the infrastructure that they need to provide high quality vision care and eye care long after the plane leaves. We don't want to just fly in, do surgery, and leave. Mm -hmm. We want to fly in, work in cooperations with, cooperation with those local health care providers, okay. and then train them to ultimately become trainers in their own country. Help them develop the systems at their hospitals, the equipment in their hospitals, so that they can provide ongoing, long-term, sustainable, high-quality eye care. And that's really how Orbis's model has changed. We started with the Flying Eye Hospital, we still have the Flying Eye Hospital, mm -hmm. and we also now have a leave behind, and that is working with those individuals in country. We also work with the ministries of health, okay. and we work with the local ophthalmologic societies, so that there is a true infrastructure to deliver high quality eye care and vision care long after the plane leaves. And our goal now is to go back to some of the countries a year or two or three later so that we could see, Your okay, what was the result of our work? Now here we are three years later, how are those docs doing? How are those nurses doing that we trained three years ago? Mm -hmm. How's the hospital performing? What are their outcomes? Are their surgical complication rates reduced because of the training that we together were able to provide to them? So you're basically, there's this web and this network and now the next steps are following up to see like um, how great the footprint has been. So if you could say what was next for Orbis, what's next? Well, what's next for Orbis is a brand new plane. We actually have been privileged to have donated by FedEx an MD-10, which is a, again, it's a DC-10 with a different engine and cockpit, one that will require instead of three pilots, and by the way, we have all volunteer pilots. Our volunteer pilots are from FedEx and also from United Airlines. They volunteer and give up their time, just as our faculty do. So we will move from three to two pilots. We will also have a state-of-the-art cockpit. We, as well, will have a much easier time of maintaining and, and, and keeping that um, plane current because more and more we're finding that pilots are trained in, in digital technology in the cockpit as opposed to manual technology. So we're very excited about as well the fact that this plane will have a very much state-of-the-art advanced operating system that will include modules that will be placed into the plane that again will be state-of-the-art operating theaters that will be able to accommodate our trainees, um, our state-of-the-art classroom. We hope for it to be all wireless. We hope to be able to really take the technology on the plane and the video conferencing and the real-time yeah. streaming of video to a whole nother level with this new plane. And again, we hope to make, continue to make about six to eight missions or visits or tours every year into countries where we have programs or plan to develop programs. Sounds like you have a big journey ahead of you, but it, it sounds like you're more than capable. We wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Stay right where you are, because there's much more on Open right after this. So here are the keys. Congratulations, it's officially yours. I'm sure you'll have many happy years here. Except for you, because you'll be gone three years from now, struck down by the same disease that got your father. So you won't be around for them. And sadly, it could have been detected early with a simple test, but you didn't have it. Okay, who wants to check out the backyard? 
For a list of tests every man should have, go to ahrq.gov. Did you find a flashlight on the batteries? Yes. Did you make sure we're not missing anything in the first aid kit? Yep. Did you go through the plan with the kids again? Yes. The more you prepare today, the more you'll be able to reduce the devastating effects of a tornado, an earthquake, a power outage, or any other disaster. Hands can do incredible things. Now they can even help save a life with hands-only CPR. If you see an adult suddenly collapse, just call 911, then push hard and fast in the center of the chest until help arrives. Learn more at handsonlycpr.org. Now, Krista, make sure you stay with her the whole time. She's new to the country. This is her Mom. first day. This Mom. is a brand Mom. new country. Mom. It's a whole different it's culture. Be okay. Now, make sure you stay with her the whole time. I'll be here right okay. after school to pick you up. Okay, Mom. Okay, have fun. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Ignore my mom. She's so annoying. She's totally freaking out about this whole thing. She freaks out about everything. She always does that. Ugh. Ignore my mom. So, you ready for your first day in the wicked castle of doom? I mean, like, seriously, it's so boring. I don't know how they could put us through this, like, every single day. How many schools do you have in your village? Hello and welcome back. The Garifuna Coalition is encouraging Garifuna American high school students to honor their heritage through their first annual essay contest. Every student must write an essay entitled, What Does It Mean to Be a Garifuna American? All students from grades 9 through 12 are encouraged to participate. On set to explain more are two members of the Garifuna Coalition, Executive Director Jose Avila and Managing Director Sulma Arasu, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So, can you tell me what went, what was the, what went into creating this essay? I mean, a lot of us are of Hispanic ha heritage, and we don't really know our history. What went into this? Well, absolutely. And for us, it becomes even more complicated because we are Hispanic, but we also have our own ethnicity, Garifuna. And I always like to refer to the fact that New York City found out that we were here on March 25, 1990, the Happy Land Social Club fire, where 87 victims died. Well, 60% of those victims were Garifunas, and no one knew it until we started mentioning it. Uh, now, what's amazing was that we have been here since the 30s when we started migrating to New York, and no one really knew. Uh, so that's part of the reason for creating uh, this contest and also four years ago we were fortunate to get the state, the city and the bar to proclaim Garifuna Heritage Month March 11th uh, to April the 12th in recognition of the exile of the Garifuna from the original island of St. Vincent to Honduras which is how we ended up in Central America. So a, and, and to make it even more complicated now we have the first generation Garifuna Americans children that were born in the United States mm -hmm. to their different parents who don't really know the history. So this is a way to maintain the history alive and more importantly, passing it on to the next generation. Can you give me a quick blurb, uh, Sulma, on what is, what is the history of the organization? What is the history of the Garifuna here in um, the United States? And also how you guys migrated from St. Vincent to Honduras and subsequently the United States? Okay, uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, rich uh, history. Uh, it happened during the, uh, 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 the Carib War in 1997. We were actually exiled from the island of St. Vincent uh, to the nearby island of Bali Sioux. And on March 11th, like Jose Francisco Avila stated, we were um, placed in a convoy ship and we ended up, uh, due to a subsequent shipwreck, we ended up in the coastline of, 
of uh, Central America, which was the island of Roatán in Honduras. And then we dispersed from uh, Honduras to Nicaragua, Guatemala, and, and Belize. And due uh, to you know the business of uh, merchant marines, we ended up uh, here in in New York. Not right now, we have 200,000 Garifunas living in New York alone, and an estimated 100,000 Garifunas living in Bronx alone. Wow! <laughs> so I, I just want to correct that it was 1797. 1797. Yeah, I, I figured it was in 1997. <laughs> I crossed the numbers. <laughs> Thank you, Jose. <all> <laughs> wow. <laughs> But, but can you tell me what does it mean to have this essay? A lot of people don't know their history, and sometimes mm -hmm. when you don't know your history, you can't really go forward and go forward as an educated person. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to have this first annual essay contest? I mean, it's it's so important. Uh, identity is number one. When I was in college, I did my research on my culture just to find out who I am, right, and where I come from, uh, just to really get the facts together, despite this 1997. <laughs> but it's important. I, I feel like a lot of young people also battle with the identity uh, crisis. And right now, because of the Garifuna Coalition, a lot of us are beginning to identify ourselves as Garifuna. So we really wanted to give them uh, basically the stage as to say what their experience are to hear their voices what what it is that they want to do and accomplish and what it is to be you know part of, of, of the the fabric of the American and just to get an idea from them to kind of formulate a workshop a six-week workshop around identity to see how they can now uh, spend uh, I guess less time in trying to figure out who they are because we're gonna educate them on that and spend more time on identifying their skills and how they're gonna be successful in the future and also give back to their community as so well. So the essay you could say is sort of the final project from the six week workshop in understanding who you are. It's actually the beginning of the six week workshop oh, really? because we want to find out where they are in, in terms of identity wise and what it is that they're battling and what it is that they want to accomplish and then formulate the workshop around that. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's interesting. So the essay is only 300, it's a max of 350 words, which I feel is like a little, it's just, just, I guess I'm very wordy, so I feel like that's, <laughs> <I'm with you. laughs> that's a short bit of space to explain who I am, um, who my people are, and where I see myself going. Um, what do you hope, like, ultimately when you evaluate these essays? I know there's going to be a first, a second, and a third prize. What about four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten? <laughs> what about the rest of them? Uh, actually, uh, this uh, subsequent program that we're going to, everyone that participates in the essay is going to qualify for a six-week seminar okay. that is going to be provided on identity. So even though they're uh, for one, first, second, and third, and everyone will get the opportunity. And the hope is that we can continue this into a more extensive program, and as Sulma mentioned, we can get them involved in serving the community. A and just uh, uh, as an example, I was born in Honduras, and I came to America at the age of 15. And I always tell the story that it wasn't until I learned English that I found out the true history of the Garifunas. I never knew it when I left Honduras. And I, then I realized that it was because it was written by the British and it was written in English. And uh, just about every one of us has had that experience. So that's, again, part of the process of now trying to instill in the next generation who they are and also helping them identify and know exactly who they are and not only that, but also know the history and finding it on their own, uh, by, by their own efforts and their own words. So someone, if, if we have someone sitting at home, a mom or dad or even a kid, um, deciding like, I'm not sure if I'm a Garif Puna, how, how, how do we go about qualifying for this essay and how do we determine if we are a Garif Puna? Uh, actually, I like to describe it as, uh, I guess the Garifuna is kind of easy to identify and it's an African descendant with a Spanish name. <laughs> 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 uh, like myself, Jose Francisco Avila, uh, and there are, are many others. And typically, again, uh, we are located in Honduras, Guatemala, Belize, and Nicaragua. And yeah, because the, another thing that's interesting was that those of us that were exiled were the ones that maintained the culture, the identity, including the language. The ones that remain in St. Vincent and the Grenadines today are English speakers. So they lost the culture. And so we were fortunate in a way that we were exiled and ended up in the remote areas of Honduras and as a result were able to maintain it. But again, we are located in Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, and Belize, and anyone from there who looks like me and <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> 
Simple qualifications. <laughs> um, so if someone's interested in finding out more about this, is there a website that they can log on to? Is there a telephone number they should call? What should they do? Absolutely. They could log on to www.garifunacoalition.org. Go on, click on Gadi Youth, and all the details for the essays will be there as, as well as an entry form. So what's the deadline for this essay contest? It is actually going to be December 30th, December 30th at 3 p.m. 3 p.m., exactly. <laughs> and they can, if they ha have additional information, they can call 718-402-7700. 718-402-7700. So should this be type double space times New Roman? Um, how should <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I'm trying to help you out because you might get something. <laughs> All the information is on the oh. website. Okay. As Suma mentioned, if they click on the Gary Youth uh, tab, there are all the information is, is there. And as far as the 350, we actually use the standard that we found of uh, the typical essay contest there. And as, as it is, uh, we've heard some complaints. Well, is that too difficult? Well, if you're in high school, you should be able to write 350. Uh, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Thank you, guys. Thank um, you. So we look to hear about, um, we look to find out who are SA winner one, two, and three, and also about the program, how the success of the program, and what's next. We will Absolutely. come back to share it with you and the audience. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. How do you break down over 300 years of Bronx African American history into two hours? Find out more and act right after this. Uh, Mom, I'm not going to go to college. What are you saying? You've got to go to college. Well, they offered me a job, and... Son, college is much more important. No. Yes. No, Mom. Yes. Anyways, it's my decision. Okay, well then decide what degree you're going to get because you will go to college. Their tomorrow depends on your words today. The Hispanic Scholarship Fund has the information you need to help your kids go to college. The magical thing about using energy wisely is that anyone can do it. Turn off lights. Use energy-saving light bulbs. And turn off computers and game systems when not in use. Make a change and we can really fly. Grab a grown-up and go online to energy.gov slash kids. Right. My what? We are all free and equal. Don't discriminate. You have the right to life. You have the right to life. And to live in freedom and safety. You have a right to education. You have a right to your own things. You have the right to social security. You have the right to play. You have the right to democracy. You have the right to asylum. You have the right to take responsibility. And no one and nobody can take these rights and freedoms away from you. Why are you doing this? You have a right to know. Remember how much you said you liked mine? Oh. <laughs> you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of siblings in foster care who'll take you just as you are. Welcome back. On Saturday, October 29th, the Bronx Library Center at Kingsbridge is hosting an event that celebrates over 300 years of African American history in the Bronx using books. Here to tell us more is community researcher Morgan Powell. Welcome to the show. Welcome back to the show. You've been here before. It's an absolute honor, Sylvia. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for being here. You have this whole pile of books. Can you take me through this? Wow. Well, thanks. Um, first, I want to thank Bronxit, and I want to thank you, and I want to thank the whole family here for being so sweet. This is a really beautiful environment that you create here. Um, 
These books are a fragment of what we're going to share with the public on Saturday. I, uh, I love books. I grew up in a, in a home that had a bookshelf, and I'm glad that my family made that a value from the beginning. Uh, I love the Bronx. It has so many recently renovated uh, libraries. The New York Public Library has made a major investment in the Bronx over the last 10 years, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm just very proud that we have those public resources available to us. And I, I guess I want to share both my love of literature and reading and writing with mm -hmm. the public. Um, but I also want to say thank you, because the older I get, the more I recognize that the only way I've been able to do what I do in life, because I'm a landscape designer by, by trade, uh, is because of all the beautiful people I've encountered. So this is one of my ways of giving back. So 300 years of African-American history through books. Can you take Just me... Just about. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. <laughs> can, you take me, can you take me through the books? Um, if I were to go to the library, what's, what's necessary reading? I'm looking here. It's 400 years of African-American history. Um, obviously uh -huh. illustrated by the Schomburg um, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Institute. Uh -huh. Can you take me through this? Sure, my pleasure. Yeah, and I definitely want to uh, give a big up to the, the Schomburg Center, which is part of the New Public Library System. It's a research library, so people can go uh, all year long, 12 months. There, it, there's a performing arts center there, as well as a library. There's a bookshop, so there are different ways to experience the culture. Um, but I, I really want to kind of share, share with people that Libraries don't just contain books, they contain all kinds of media that help illuminate a culture. Oh, nice. So for example, um, I'm going to be uh, celebrating the cultural history of the Bronx. And so this is an image of Grandmaster Flash and the Furious uh, Five, including Rahim right there, the gentleman in the center of the frame, uh, wearing his white sweater. Believe it or not, this gentleman throughout his whole fantastic career lived in, in the Lambert Houses in West Farms until last year. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah, and just going through it. Um, I really want to uh, do my part to bring up what people have kind of seen and known for a long time, which is that African Americans have been interested in the environment forever. Uh, this is the original cover of Wake Up Everybody, which everybody knows. Wake up everybody. This is it. And look <laughs> at what it has. It's an overtly environmental message about people and the natural environment. Going back to the Schomburg Center, this is just absolutely wonderful. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read something very briefly uh, to you. So page 19 in The Black New Yorkers. 1625, 11 enslaved African men arrived in New Amsterdam with the Dutch West India Company and became the first municipal labor force. The workers built Fort Amsterdam, cleared fields, and constructed roads and homes. They also planned, cleared land for farms beyond New Amsterdam, including Staten Island, Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx. That's right. We've had an, we've had, uh, uh, an impression in here, uh, here in the Bronx, since at least 1625. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> and that's a book that we can get. Um, if someone's interested in picking up that book, they can just stop into the library. Or I know the New York Public Library, you can go online and you can put in the book and you can reserve a copy. Um, what do you encourage people sitting at home to do? Is there a specific African-American um, history book list? What should they do? Wow. Um, it, it's a great question. One of the things that, uh, that I'm very excited about that's happening is um, I've entered a dialogue, but this is not my dialogue, this is our community dialogue. Mm -hmm. uh, I've entered a dialogue with the New York Public Library right here in the Bronx to invigorate a Friends of the Bronx Library Center. And the reason that's important is um, the New York Public Library is a nonprofit organization. Mm -hmm. And they're already doing great work, however, they can do more to the extent that those of us who have the resources and interest help them. So believe it or not, uh, virtually every other borough has a Friends of whatever their main library system is. But we don't have one here. Guys, let's do it. Uh, we are in a recession. A lot of people are facing hard times, but that's not true of everybody. There are more than enough of us in the community who can contribute 50 to $100 on an annual basis to buy specific groups of books that they don't have the resources to get on their own. So I don't think there is a African-American um, I'm, I'm sure, I, mean, I, I, I think that there, there's, there's room for a much bigger African-American section, and that can be facilitated by everybody listening to this, uh, calling them up and asking them, how do, we part, uh, how do we be part of a new Friends of the Bronx Library? System? So on October 29th at the King Bridge Library, what will, what will <laughs> Bronxites get a, a vision of? 
Awesome. All right, here we go. I want everyone to zoom in on this uh, picture of this uh, gentleman here. <laughs> You're looking at a picture of Marcel Woolery. Who is Marcel Woolery? Marcel Woolery was the treasurer of the Bronx River Restoration Project Incorporated, which began the whole effort to clean up the Bronx River south of the Bronx Zoo beginning 1974. Mr. Woolery Mr. worked in a factory okay. in uh, the central Bronx. This is the time in the Bronx where you could be a working class person with no college education whatsoever, come out of high school and get a really good paying job with benefits, a pension and all that. And he was part of that era and he devoted over 25 years of his life um, uh, being a supervisor of work crews that helped build the Bronx River Arts Center to clean up the Bronx River and acting as treasurer. So you're going to learn about many, many other people like Marcel Woolery. There's actually an image of black men uh -huh. built the Capitol. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But the purpose of that image is, um, I just want to set it up. Like, how, how, do, how do we understand what we're doing on Saturday? A lot of people around the country are helping us to see America through uh, a specific African-American lens. Meaning okay. What, how, how did America become what it is uh, based on African-American input? So this is a book about sites all around Washington, D.C., including the major monuments that were literally built by African-Americans, or certainly African-American men, uh, built the foundations of the Capitol, the White House, etc. Uh, interesting facts. I see here you have uh, the Bronx Sound Walk. What is that? Is that something that I pop in, that I can download, pop in, walk around? It's three CDs. Most people don't have like a CD player. Is there a way to get this in digital format so um, I can walk around and experience this audio guide? Okay, yeah, sure. Let me, <laughs> let me, just, do, let me just do the whole rundown starting with this. So, okay. yeah. So, yeah. So, you could pop this in your computer and, uh, and then tra you translate it to an MP3. This is, uh, you're looking at a, uh, at a picture of a uh, hip-hop pioneer from Bronx River. And uh, this is something that I bought at the Museum of the City of New York. And I just want to show all of these uh, media to illustrate that. Even though there is no book yet on uh, the Bronx River's African-American history, you can find elements of our history through all of these. So we'll go through really fast. Here's a li lightning round. The Bronx River. The Bronx River by Dr. Martin DeCat, who used to teach at Fannie Lou Hamer Freedom High School. And the Bronx River is about the social, economic, and environmental history of the Bronx River. Uh, from before, um, the community got westernized in the days of the Native Americans all the way up to the present day. And it does highlight a few African Americans. Ooh. The Guarantee. This is a book about a sister who was from a very prominent African American family in the Midwest, whose father owned a bank a real estate company and other resources, she wound up living in the Bronx as a social worker and she wrote this book about her family. I hate to cut you off. Um, where can people <laughs> find out more information about this? So it's October 29th at the Kingsbridge Library. The Bronx Library Center right off uh, Fordham Road and the Grand Concourse. Okay, so it's, that, it's the Fordham Center. It's not the Kingsbridge. It's okay. the main branch. Okay, it's the main branch. So people can come there and find out more information. If they want to contact you, find out more information on African American history here in the Bronx or what's going on, where should they um, contact you at? Thanks so much. It's so generous of you for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to create a continuum here. So I'm on Facebook. So you want to type in Bronx River Sankofa and you'll find out all of the programs uh, which include Saturday's talk at 2.30. It's also going to have a walking tour that we're doing in the spring. Okay. And more. Okay, so we look forward to having you back here. This is a topic that I think has legs and we just didn't have enough time. I'll Thank come you. back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you will, Morgan. <laughs> Thank you, Morgan. It's an honor. It's been a pleasure coming into your homes. We'd like to thank our guests for joining us and especially you, our viewers, for tuning in. You can catch the Recable cast tonight of Open at 10 p.m. on Channel 67. And of course, you can catch a new episode Friday at 10 a.m. with Rena Valentine.